Over the last several weeks and months, we have examined the prophecies and the writings of the prophet Jeremiah, and we have seen a continual pattern of judgment and redemption. Our Haftor portion this week, Jeremiah 16, 19 through 17, 14, is no different with one key exception. Unlike most of the book of Jeremiah, this section is in a poetic form. Contained within this Haftorah are some often quoted verses, many of which are quoted by Yeshua as well as the disciples in their writings and letters. And virtually every verse in this Jeremiah passage is also found in the Psalms. Now this section of scripture contains the unusual identification of the sins of Israel and Judah along with the promise of a future redemption. But what is so special about this prophecy of Jeremiah? And why is it so important to Yeshua and the disciples? I'm Dan Cathcart and this is Ancient Perspectives. To understand this poetic prophecy from the viewpoint of the people of Jeremiah's day, we have to read it in a little bit of a broader context. God gave Jeremiah specific instructions about his own lifestyle and how he was to conduct himself. Jeremiah was to be a living example or a sign for the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Look at Jeremiah 16, 1 through 4. The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bore them, and their fathers who begot them in this land. They shall die gruesome deaths, and they shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried, but they shall be like refuge on the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth. Jeremiah was not to take a wife or to raise a family in this place because of the coming invasion of, by Babylon. And the reason was that this invasion and judgment of God would be incredibly brutal. The people who are not taken in exile to Babylon would die a horrible death at the hands of the Babylonian army, and those left alive would not even be able to follow the Torah statutes regarding the treatment and burial of the dead. Now, Because of this, Jeremiah was also not to practice the mourning rituals, even for family members. Look at Jeremiah 16, 5 through 8. For thus says the Lord, do not enter the house of mourning, nor go to lament or bemoan them, for I have taken away my peace from this people, says the Lord. Loving kindness and mercies, both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them nor shall men break bread in mourning for them to comfort them for the dead, nor shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or their mother. Also, you shall not go into the house of feasting to sit with them, to eat and to drink. God was soon to show the people of Judah and Jerusalem the power of his judgment they would be unable to receive his loving kindness and his mercies. Their population would be decimated and their cities ravaged. The Lord says that the people would come to Jeremiah wondering why he pronounced such an awful judgment against them. Jeremiah 16, 10 through 11. And it shall be when you show this people all these words that they say to you, why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says the Lord, they have walked after other gods, and have served them, and worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and not kept my law. 
Now, even though they may not accept Jeremiah's words of judgment, the reasons are clear. They have a covenant with God to, to obey his commandments, and they have continually ignored it and severely broken it. And it was time for judgment. Now, leading up to the scripture of our Haftor reading, Jeremiah speaks of a restoration of Israel. Look at Jeremiah 16, verse 15. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands where he has driven them. For I will bring them back to their land, which I gave to their fathers. The actual Haftor reading for this week begins with Jeremiah 16, 19 through 21. O Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. Will a man make gods for himself which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know, I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. Now, verse 19 starts out with a near quote of Psalms 18. Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Jeremiah 16, 19 through 21 also speaks of Gentiles coming to the Lord out of their idolatry. They will come seeking the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Gentiles will seek the very thing which the Jewish people have been rejecting. Now this may be a prophetic hint of the time after Messiah Yeshua when the Gentiles answer the call to repentance and receive salvation. Look at Acts 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judah heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Beginning with chapter 17, Jeremiah takes an abrupt turn, speaking again of the sins of Judah and the punishment. As we have seen, the more Jeremiah tries to get through to the people, the deeper into sin they seem to sink. The opening statement is rather strong and suggests that they are now beyond the point of no repentance. Jeremiah 17, 1 and 2. The sins of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With the point of a diamond it is engraved on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their wooden images by the green trees on the high hills. Now iron tools and diamond scribes are the instruments for carving into and shaping stone. Jeremiah is telling them that they have hearts of stone. Their sins are now indelibly inscribed on their hearts for all to see. Because of this state, is repentance now impossible for them? Now God does not leave living, breathing human beings without hope and without the ability to repent and to change and be forgiven. In a Jewish Midrash, this issue is addressed in a hypothetical conversation between the people and God. When Israel stood before God for judgment, they said before him, Master of the universe, the heavens and the earth testify against us regarding our sins. And God replied, I shall remove them. Israel responded, but still, our name is associated with disloyalty to you. To which God answered, I will give you a new name. Again, Israel said, but you will remember. God retorted, I will forget your earlier sins. Israel answers, in your heart, you will remember. God responds, I will not take it to heart. Israel responds with the verse from our Haftorah, but it is written before you as it is written. The guilt of Judah is written with a stylus of iron. And God responds, things that are written can also be erased. And since I wrote it, I can also erase it. Jeremiah goes on to describe what happens to the, their land after they are exiled to Babylon, the promised land. Their heritage and inheritance will become plunder and treasure for their enemies. 
Jeremiah 17, 3 through 4. O my mountain in the field, I will give as plunder your wealth, all your treasures, and your high places of sin within all your borders, and you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage which I give you, and I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever." Now this one last warning about their impending exile is immediately followed by a reminder of perhaps why they faced this exile. In whom are they placing their trust? In man? or in God. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Verse 8 is a paraphrase of Psalms 1-3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The sages say that the heart is the first to stray from the Lord, and once the heart departs from the ways of God, the rest is sure to follow. The Lord is our source of nourishment and water, the necessities of life. When we follow the ways or desires of our flesh, the life-giving water is sparse like a desert. The Lord knows the heart. He sees through the facade of our lives to the truth within us. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. David also speaks of God testing the hearts of men in Psalm 7 verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tests the heart and minds. The Apostle Paul addresses this very thing in his letter to the Romans, Romans 2, 3 through 7. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. This same judgment will be seen again at the end of the age. God will again search our hearts. Look at Revelation 2, 23b. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now we must come before God in all humility and sincerity. King David wrote in Psalms 139, 23, 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Jeremiah's next statement seems to be addressing their corrupt financial dealings and dishonest gain. Jeremiah 17, 11. Like the partridge that gathers a brood which she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches but not by right. In the midst of his days they will leave him, and at his end he will be a fool. 
At the end of Psalm 55, David speaks of the deceitful heart of men that will cause their lives to be cut short. Psalms 55, 23. But you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Now this speaks of the rampant covetousness and Merrill F. Unger in his commentary on Jeremiah, he writes, She, Judah, is compared to a partridge who gathers a brood which she did not hatch. For a little while she struts in great pomp with her illegitimate brood, but the fledglings soon desert their foster mother at the very time she needs them most to foster her ego. She is left looking like the fool she is. In much the same way, Judah's ill-gotten wealth will be taken from them in exile. The Haftorah closes out with a profound warning about those who forsake the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 12-13 A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Again, we see the allusion to the life-giving water which the Lord provides. This passage, particularly verse 13, is strongly suggested that it is the very scripture which Yeshua actually wrote in the ground when he was confronted by the scribes and Pharisees when they brought him a woman whom they say was caught in the act of adultery. Now, since Yeshua actually stooped down to write something in the dust of the ground not once but twice, he may have also written the names of those very scribes and Pharisees. John 8, 3 through 6. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they had set her in the midst. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. Now this is a story which we have taught on before in an entire study lesson in our book, The Shadows of the Messiah in the Torah, Volume 1. In essence, the, these corrupt scribes and Pharisees confronting Yeshua on this day were not so innocent themselves. They had forsaken God and had deceitful hearts, just as Jeremiah described in our Haftorah reading. Now, like the people of Jeremiah's day, many among the Jewish leadership and the people in Yeshua's time were also corrupt with hearts of stone and not following the Torah. Our Haftorah this week ends at verse 14 but it would be a good idea to continue to the end of the prophetic and poetic passage. Jeremiah 17, 14 through 18. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Indeed, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd who follows you, nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It is right there before you. Do not be a terror to me. You are my hope in the day of doom. Let them be ashamed who persecute me, but do not let me be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom, and destroy them with double destruction. Jeremiah prays for his own deliverance and for the deliverance of all of Israel. In this prayer, Jeremiah says that through all of the persecution, he has remained faithful to God. He has been a good shepherd, faithful to all that the Lord has given him. Now we too are given a task to perform. We are called not to be only disciples of Yeshua, but to also be apostles, which simply means sent ones. So whatever task that we are sent to do, the lesson we can learn from Jeremiah is to always be faithful to God and to that task. To not let our hearts stray away from the Lord and His ways. 
He is always faithful to keep his covenant with us and will always be ready and willing to accept our repentance. I'm Dan Cathcart for Moed Ministries International. Shalom and be blessed.